you ready for me, Royce? All right. Uh, good evening and welcome to the May 12th, 2020 regular board meeting of the Roswell Independent School District. I now call this meeting to order. May I have a roll call, please, Ms. Whitcamp? Ellen Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? Yes. Yeah. All right, it's time for our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, America. to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Justice for all. I salute the flag of the state of New Mexico, the Zia symbol of perfect friendship among the United, United Cultures. Okay, are there any modifications to the agenda? Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I'd like two modifications to the agenda. The first one is we need to pull the April bills, and the second is we need to pull the uh, operational budget, and uh, Mr. Cole will talk to you about a special meeting towards the end of the month. Okay. All right. Uh, may I have a motion to approve with the modification? So moved. So moved. I have a second. motion made by Ms. Kirk and a second made by Ms. Sanchez. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, we have to still do roll call votes. So may I have a roll call, please? Ellen Getty. Yes. Hope Morales. Yes. Hilda Sanchez. Yes. Mona Kirk. Yes. James Edwards. Yes. All right, let's begin with recognition. Uh, Mr. Getty, members of the board, audience, I am going to have Mr. Luck from Goddard talk to us about his student from Goddard High School. Mr. Luck, are you present? Yes, sir, I am, Mr. Gottlieb. Will you tell us about Luis? Absolutely, I will. President Getty, members of the board, it's my honor to uh, present uh, this honor for you guys tonight. Uh, this is actually from Luis's uh, FCCLA teacher. Uh, Luis Monroe is an upcoming senior and is running to be his class valedictorian at Goddard High School. As a member of FCCLA, he's helped as a new advisor to guide the program in a positive direction. In March of this year, he applied for state officer position with the program and was voted on by his peers to be vice president of public relations for the state of New Mexico. And he was elected. In this position, he'll be working with five other students that will share in the state officer duties for FCCLA. He is a hardworking and responsible student, and we're very proud of Goddard High School for taking on these new responsibilities, in addition to being an excellent representative of Goddard High School and the Roswell community. Awesome. Uh, anything about the teacher, Mr. Luck? Uh, this is Ms. Hansel, Ms. Carly Hansel. She is in her first year at Goddard High School. And she has done a wonderful job, and we're super proud of her and the work that she's done with that program. Excellent. Will you relay our congratulations from, from the board and from the administration office, how proud we are of Luis and for Carly for working with the students at Goddard High School. I will, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Luck. Thank Have you, good Mr. Evening. Luck. Thank you, Mr. Luck. Uh, do we have any inquiries or general comments tonight? No, sir, we do not. All right. Let's move on to the approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Getty, members of the board, I rec recommend approval of the minutes of the regular board meeting of April 14, 2020. Are there any corrections, deletions to the minutes of the regular board meeting of April 14, 2020? Okay, if not, no. may, I, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Okay, I have a motion Kirk. made by Ms. Kirk. Who was the second? Was that Ms. Sanchez? I second. Yes. All right. 
Uh, roll call, please. Ellen Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? James Mr. Edwards? It's okay. Um. Yeah. Yeah, yay. All right, uh, next we have the consent agenda. Uh, Mr. Getty, members of the board, I recommend approval of the consent agenda of the authorize the May bills and approve the May bars only. Okay, is there any discussion? If not, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. May Second. I have Second, Mike. Okay, who, who, I know uh, Mr. Edwards made the motion. I didn't hear who seconded. Kirk. Okay, Ms. Kirk with the second. And a roll call again. Alan Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? Mr. Edwards? Yeah, yes. All right. Uh, next we have the action items. Uh, first we have the Roswell High School application to apply for Harbor Freight Tools for Schools. Uh, Mr. Getty, before I make my recommendation, I would like to have Mr. Pilar Carrasco from Roswell High School to present this to the board and what it's all about. Uh, Mr. Carrasco, are you on? Yes, sir. I sure am. All right. Will, Super you, will you please talk to the board about that? Yes. Superintendent Gottlieb, President Getty, distinguished uh, members of the board. I would like uh, to request your permission uh, on behalf of Roswell High School to apply for Harbor Freight Award to help the Roswell High School Ag and Construction Programs grow. The prize can be up to $100,000. And they also give uh, $50,000 that we would like to uh, get this approved in order to improve our construction, our construction program here at Roswell High School. The way this is done, it's it's called Harbor Freight Tools for Schools Rewards Teachers Excellence. So we have Mr. Cody Carter that has done an unbelievable job for us at, at Roswell High School. His students, he's also going to team up with our um, other ag teacher uh, by Mr. Schuyler Pierce. And one of the things that they're planning on doing is building a, um, a tiny home that where our construction team would build a tiny home and Mr. Schuyler Pierce's students would build a trailer which it, that it would go on. Both of our teachers feel that this would take us from a beginning stage of uh, improving our uh, career and technical education into a more advanced and, and, a, and a state leader in that career technical education. So I, I believe it would be great to, we've checked on it and it's no, um, there's no matching. The district doesn't have to match it or anything like that. It, it's a straight award. And 100% of it would go towards our kids. Wow, that's cool. Uh, with that being said, um, Mr. Getty, members of the board, I recommend approval of the Roswell High School application to apply for Harbor Freight Tools for Schools and I'm very proud of their, their program out there. They've really been working hard. Yeah, I, I, does anybody else have a question? I have one if nobody else does, but if somebody else has a question, I'll let you guys go first. Just introduce yourself. Okay, okay the, the one question I have, and this is just because I wanted to know, so if they get the 50,000, will they still be able to do the projects they want to do or is that like if they get the 100,000 and if they get the 50,000, they're going to do one or the other? My understanding is the 100,000 would, would give them plenty of uh, revenue to, or plenty of, of funds to finish that tiny home and the trailer and everything. If they only get the 50,000, um, then they can adjust what they do um, or, or multiple uh, tiny houses as they go forward and of course what what they're trying to do that uh, is 
do something that where the where the program could be self sustainable. So I don't have the specific answer to that. We just uh, when when I spoke to Mr. to, to Mr. Carter, it it is possible that if they get the hundred thousand, it'll actually be multiple projects that they would be able to fund. But the fifty thousand would be sufficient to get at least one done. Okay. Cool. Cool. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. I hope. Uh, Hope with the motion, and I think that was Sanchez with the second. That's Sanchez. Correct. All right, uh, roll call, please. Ellen Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? Yes. All right, good. Next we have uh, bilingual renewal applications. Uh, Mr. President, uh, do we have Andrea on the line? Andrea, yes, are you there? Um, I, I will, just so we know I have Andrea on line, if the board have any questions. Mr. President, members of the board, I recommend approval of the bilingual renewal application. Okay, any discussion? Any discussion? This is Hope, and I have one question. It seems like this program is offered at some of our schools within the district. Is there a need um, at our other schools where we don't currently have it? I'll answer uh, that, and I'll allow Andrea to get the, the issue. Some of the problems, Ms. Morales, we've been struggling with is teachers wanting to stay in the bilingual program uh, for the length of time they have to teach, both in English and Spanish and the amount of work that they have to do. Um, it's, it's been a struggle, the licensure issue, we've had some issues with completing some of the courses online. Uh, Andrea has been working quite hard with the universities trying to get those, those things move forward, including with the TESOL endorsements. So from that point, Andrea, please continue. The, the need for some of the schools, it, it, there is some, in some schools we have the EL, EL program, and the schools that we don't have a bilingual, but our bilingual numbers are a bit smaller than they were before because we have a lot of incoming kindergartners where before they used to be a large number. Now we have uh, a lot of older siblings uh, speaking English to them, so they're coming in uh, not qualifying. So in right now I could see maybe one more school that could use the bilingual program, but then again, like Mr. Gottlieb said, the lack of teachers too and you know teachers wanting to to move up either whether it's grade level or to move down to elementary thank you this is mrs sanchez i have a question was that who was that was that mrs sanchez yes and mrs sanchez i have a quick question for mrs nieto go ahead okay uh if i pull out ESL program has been implemented. Is there a written curriculum with scope and sequence for the ESL or, a, or the ELD instruction in our district? Uh, they right now, yes, all those ELs, they use a curriculum resource. There's not one that's written by the district, but they are using the, uh, the program language power, which has, uh, which touches on the four domains of the access that they're tested on, listening, reading, and writing. And that one is uh, teacher-based. It's the teacher in front giving instruction instead of computer-based. So yes, mm -hmm. the ELs are using that as well as the bilingual part for the ELD. Okay, thank you. All right, if there isn't any more discussion, may I have a motion to approve? So moved, Kirk. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second by Morales. Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Alan Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? Yeah. All right. Uh, next, we have the 2021 Fine Arts Education Act application 
members of the board just know we have Abby Smith online. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I recommend approval of the 20, 2021 Fine Arts applica Act application. Okay, is there, are there any questions? Mrs. Oh, Hassan, I have one. Oh, okay, hold on, I got two of you going. Um, introduce yourself and I think I heard, did I hear Hope? Ms. Morales? Yes, just really quickly. So Abby, to you and your teachers, thank you for providing the hands-on activities for students during the distant learning. I know my personal children have really enjoyed those. And my question is, if we continue to do more of the blended learning in the future, is it an option for some of our art teachers to do something with media arts as one of the focus areas? I saw in the application that the media arts section was marked off. Um, President Getty, Superintendent Gottlieb, and members of the board, may I speak to that? Yes. Yes, please. So um, I, I think that that would be um, definitely a terrific um, idea and, and something to look towards. I can say at this point, um, we would definitely need some professional development in that area. Um, and, and it's just not something that any of us um, have really an endorsement in. But definitely we could pursue that. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, did Thank somebody you. else have a question? Mrs. Sanchez? Yes, okay, Mrs. Sanchez, go ahead. I have a, a quick question. I know that I was reading through the, through the application and it stated that it supports academic success, raises school attendance, and empowers students to discover their own talents and values of, values of talents of others. Could you uh, explain a little bit about what assessment data is being used to measure this? Um, yes, ma'am. So especially through our arts integration specialist. We are um, connecting with teachers um, in that grade level because we only have one teacher um, as a specialist right now. And we're communicating with them, looking at their data um, to figure out where our deficits are. And um, uh, my specialist is creating a lesson um, towards that gap um, towards the standard there where the gap is and then we are doing formative assessing on um, if students are making gains in understanding um, also we have our national core art standards that all of our lessons are aligned to and um, i believe you can find there is a section in the faea that talks specifically about the different formative assessments that my teachers use um, again, it's challenging when we only have 45 minutes, but I just have such an amazing creative staff that they are finding ways um, to make certain that students are meeting those objectives. We no longer have to take the EOC at the end of the year, so as far as actual um, percentage data, we don't have that at this time, except through our arts integration. Okay, thank you. And I have one more question. I know that you have your advisory council. Who, I mean, who compromises or who makes up the, the council, your fine arts advisory council? Is it yes, all teachers? No, ma'am. Um, we have community members from our fine arts galleries. We have um, administration, so we have a couple of elementary principals. Um, we have some teachers. And we have parents. And um, it was a very organized group at the beginning, but we've had some people move away. Um, what I did at the beginning, um, when I first came on board and started the advisory council, because we didn't have um, one that was completely organized, is I, I set it up similar to how our school board is set up. So I sought out references from principals um, for parents. Um, to, to sit on that within the zone so that all areas of our district would be represented in that, whether it be a teacher or a parent. Does that answer your question? It does. Thank well, you. I have one also, to back off that. Oh. I have one more. Okay, go Mrs. Ahead. Sanchez, Sorry. go ahead. I was just going to ask, on the, on the arts education line item worksheet, it stated that you have so much money going to community artists. Are those local artists that, that help out with the program? 
Yes, ma'am. Um, we contract with them. Um, we brought in, uh, as an example, we brought in a gentleman who does um, graffiti art, um, mostly in Artesia, but has done some things here. He came in and spoke at a school about how students could use their art in a positive way, how graffiti can be positive when you are asked to do it and not to um, destroy property and the importance of understanding that. We've worked with Miranda Howe in coming in and doing legacy projects um, or other um, drawing sequences. And um, we've also utilized um, performing arts artists that are local as well. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You did an awesome job. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a uh, couple of questions too. Okay. Well, I have Ms. Kirk go first. Okay. Um, actually, I, I have a comment. I'm quite shocked to see that Ms. Uh, Vicki bring this still your, uh, the one you submit your application to because yes, she was <laughs> She was there when I I did the fine arts project and our application had to send it in, and I think she had been on board about ten years then. So she has a wealth of a no, wealth of knowledge and is a great. Yes, ma'am. I read with guy. I read all the uh, state applications with her in the summer, and she's just a great advocate for fine arts in our state. Fine arts. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so um, really the advisory board your fine arts advisory board because i had one too back in the day when i was the director but abby what role do they play in helping you put together your uh projects and just overseeing can you elaborate on that for me yes ma'am so some of it cut out are you talking again about the advisory council and how they play a part Yes, your advisory council. How do they play a role in your day-to-day um, -day operations? What do, what's their role? Yes, ma'am. So um, especially we have worked closely with the uh, RMAC um, group in putting together um, a family after hours. I um, utilized their ideas and support in knowing how we can better um, create a family interactive time. Um, Celebrate the Arts Day was absolutely amazing, but um, it became a bit of a struggle when we no longer had the space at the convention center to be able to use when they were um, shut down. And so that's when the opportunity right. came with, with RMAC. And along with that, then I have um, parents that have put uh, provided input on um, Kind of what direction we wanted to go with um, activities. We actually had our advisory council, um, I think it was two years ago, that we rewrote our vision and, and mission statement. And we did that with the advisory council, and then um, my team came together and looked that over and, and revised it as well. Um, last year, I also had him look over our goals and um, look at how we met objectives um, and to provide feedback on where we should move forward. I will admit that this year has been a little more challenging um, just with things that have happened within our district, um, but I plan on getting back, um, getting everybody back organized and running again strong next year. Great. Okay, my final question has to do with the legacy projects. Do you offer a legacy project to each of the elementary schools every year? No, ma'am. We were finding that there was a lack of space <laughs> in school buildings. Um, also, funding, you know, can be a bit of a, um, a challenge because community artists, um, it, it's hard to know their their value their true value. I mean, I know that you know this in working with them um, because just the the amount of time that they spend besides working with students on those legacy right. projects is just tremendous. They put their heart and soul into it. Um, so we were kind of doing a rotation. We were especially, um, or I was especially giving attention these last couple of years as our school buildings were remodeled and um, some projects were actually lost or destroyed. 
we were giving some TLC to those buildings that needed some more art within their buildings. Um, as you know, the tree in Berendo. Um, mm -hmm. So that's been kind of what we're doing lately. Um, this year, I've um, put money towards um, getting a photographer to take pictures of all of the murals on the walls at Del Norte um, so that those will be um, kept and chill. The photographer is going to put those on some kind of um, uh, metal or um, uh, a glass that she has. Anyway, we're going to be able to put into the new school so that we, we have those memories kept. Um, oh. Kind of like what happened at Missouri Avenue when yes, they were modeled. That's awesome. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. Mr. Edwards, did you have a question? No, I just wanted to make a comment. Yes. You know, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to that we do have art in our school system. And I got to witness a lot of the work that these, uh, that the staff has, has put in. And I'm gonna tell you, it, it's, it's real good to see when you have the parents showing up with their kids. I went to one of their deals out at the airport. And I'm gonna tell you, I had never been to one and it was an eye opener. And I'm, I, I just wanna commend the, the program that she, that she runs over there. It is, it is a, it's, it's A1, and I wish we had more art mm -hmm. in, in our school district, but I've seen the work that they've done, and it's tremendous. And for anybody that hasn't been to the, those shows, they need to go. As board members, I encourage you to go. It just, there's a lot of work and effort put in, not only by the staff, but by the parents and teachers. Thank you, so sir. I encourage all members to show up to some of these things to see what they're, what they're actually doing. And that's my comment. Very good comment. Thank you. I would uh, second Mr. Edwards, and I'm sure the rest of the board would. It's we're very, very happy with the arts program, and I know how much you guys, I know how much work you guys do, and uh, was very impressed at how you guys pulled together the take-home projects for the for the for the students. Um, when I went and looked at all those bags, I was surprised to say the least. So, great job. Great job. Uh, is there any other questions or comments? All right, with that, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. I have a motion made by Mr. Edwards and a second made by Ms. Kirk. Roll call, please. Ellen Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? Yes. All right. Uh, now we have the T-Mobile donation for the RISD student nutrition department. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I recommend approval of the T-Mobile donation for the RISD student nutrition department. Okay. Is there any discussion? May we have a little information on this, Mr. Gottlieb? Uh, Mr. Cole, are you available? Absolutely, yes, sir. So thank you, uh, Board President Getty, Superintendent Gottlieb, members of the board. Uh, this is a donation of $6,000 to the RSD Food Services uh, Student Nutrition Department. Uh, the funds are to procure gloves, masks, paper products, and other non-food items to supplement the supplies and equipment being utilized for the student meal program during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. So this is not a typical donation received by T-Mobile, and I, I'm a, a little That's baffled correct. that T-Mobile would be involved in this in, in the food. Yes, it, yes, it, it's it is um, unusual. I, I haven't seen uh, uh, or can't recall seeing a, a donation. Um, from T-Mobile Mobile, uh, or anyone else uh, to our food services department. Uh, I think it's uh, pretty, pretty outstanding uh, of them to do, uh, particularly in recognizing that uh, 
we are and have been maintaining a, a, an operational food service program uh, and it just gives me one more shot to to brag on our essential uh, staff, uh, you know, other than the maintenance, custodian, uh, uh, payroll, and business services, those kind of folks, uh, food services has really led the way um, during this uh, this uh, closure period. And uh, I, I just can't say enough. Uh, you know, we run uh, a little more, a little less some days, but right around 100 people working in food services on a daily basis. And uh, uh, again, would like to brag on them, uh, and also their director, which you which you know uh, uh, is fairly new to uh, uh, the school district this year. Uh, she has come on and uh, uh, Kimberly Meeks and just done an outstanding job with the program. We're improving the program, and uh, uh, again, uh, just can't say enough about the the work they've done and the the safety precautions they've taken from day one in handling our food and getting it out there to our, our public uh, and keeping uh, those counts up. I, I really didn't expect to see uh, the meal counts um, stay stay up, but they have. And so that's a credit to the program. That's a credit to the quality of the, the product uh, and, of course, to the work that goes into it. So uh, my hat is off to the food service uh, program and, and its staff. Nice. Thank you, Mr. Cole. Yeah, I agree. And I think every dollar is definitely needed. So kudos to Kimberly Meeks and her staff. And T-Mobile. Yes, thank you. Yes. Does anybody else have any questions or comment? Okay, if not, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Oh, Ms. So Carter. Okay, Miss. Okay, I have a motion by Miss Kirk. Who, uh, who? A second. Second by Morales. Okay, thank you. Uh, second by Morales. Roll call, please. Alan Getty. Yes. Hope Morales. Yes. Hilda Sanchez. Yes. Mona Kirk. Yes. James Edwards. Yes. All right. Next we have. Uh, Roswell High School donors choose Keep Kids Learning program donation. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I recommend approval of the RHS donors choose to Keep Kids Learning program donation. Mr. Pilar, are you still there? I am. Yes, sir. Oh, do we have, he's, he's here for questions. Is there, are there any questions about this from the board? All right, if we have no questions, may I have a motion to approve? So moved, Kirk. Okay, I have a motion made by Ms. Kirk. Do I have a second? Ms. Sanchez, I second. Sanchez. Second by Ms. Sanchez. Uh, roll call, please. Ellen Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? Yes. All right, next we have um, just a first reading uh, <clears throat> policy G2950 for military leave. Um, Mr. President, members of the board, there is a couple things I'd like to uh, point out on this issue before I turn it over to Mr. Strahil, Ms. Sanchez, and Ms. Kirk, because they're the ones that are working on it. I had asked them to bring back this policy that we had uh, prior to my time. The parts in red is uh, at the very bottom is one I'll bring to the board's attention. Uh, we, are, we do have a teacher that will be called up this fall. He's already been notified. And I just wanted to make sure the board back when I had left, we were the only school district in the nation that had given this honor uh, to provide uh, this for our employees. And what it is is all insurance and all other benefits extended to regular employees while on leave of absence should be available to those called from RISD employment to active duty. Armed Forces reserves to active duty will also be allowed to accrue sick leave during their leave of absence, which will be credited to them upon 
the return to employment with the RISD. Um, it was um, during our time over in the Mideast when this came about. We had a lot of staff with uh, sons and daughters, husband and wives, and this was something the board had talked about and I'd asked them to bring it back. At, at that time, I, I'll turn it over to Mrs. Trujillo and her committee. Thank you, Mr. Gottlieb. Thank you, uh, uh, President Getty. Um, so as Mr. Gottlieb made this, this um, policy G2954, specifically the military leave, in addition to what Mr. Gottlieb pointed out, if you look on the, the page, of, it also states that an employee of BSD can receive five day paid military leave during the time that their eligible family member is a plan. Uh, but when my husband with Middle East is and they had added this to the policy Mr. A Mr. Hill, uh, Mr. Hill? Uh, service member I tell you that was okay. really appreciated Cut it now. Out. I cannot hear all of her statements oh I'm yeah. so sorry can you hear me now we can now you're just a yes. little choppy is that better? you're cutting out yes. Mr. Hill That's okay sorry I'll try not to move I'm out in the country and so my reception <laughs> wasn't good today if I point out this page also has one more addition an employee of the Roswell Independent School District can also receive up to five days of pay leave their military family member is deployed um, that was very much appreciated I personally um, had my husband deployed um, during the this was implemented with the four board policy and I can tell really appreciated family members um, and that's also worked on this uh, with me and we have a question yeah I like I like that too I like the idea that if your spouse gets called away you get five days to kind of get get things in order I would I would imagine and I really appreciate uh, Ms. Sanchez and Ms. Kirk working on this with Mr. Hill absolutely uh, this is very important I think the ESGR has always been very supportive of our uh, teachers in the guard Absolutely. Uh, this is a really good policy. Good job, guys. Uh, any other comments? If I could just add the boardroom, there is a plaque and a flag that was actually presented half of our guardsmen that has left when I had was deployed. Um, and if you ever get a chance to look, it's on that north wall in the boardroom. And we with their helicopter to present it to the board of the support to our military. Reading. Okay, so that's first reading. So that's it. Um, okay, next we have policy J1081, open enrollment first reading. Uh, thank you, Mr. Getty, members of the board. I'll turn this over to Mr. Hill and her, her two committee members, Ms. Ms. Sanchez and Ms. Kirk, to talk about open enrollment and attendance application. Mr. Okay. Hill? Thank you. Um, policy J. Policy CJ 1080 is open enrollment. If I could um, draw to the lobby. Um, I'm sorry, we Mrs. added Trujillo, and I didn't yeah. understand. Mrs. You. Trujillo, we, okay. you're choppy again. Well, let me move a little bit so it's better here. Give me one moment. Okay, we'll try this again. Is that better? I think so. We'll, better. we'll see. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I understand Next the whole time. country living thing. Yeah, maybe if you leave the phone up to your mouth, that will help. Yeah, I, I will do that. I'm holding it. Hopefully it's not too loud now. So we've got item number six and seven that we've added to this policy. Number six is the zone exemption. Um, that would be approved if space is available in the school after the 10th day. And item seven is for incoming high school students. That is for grades 9 and 12 for the legal guard 
the end would be notified no later than May if the zoning is granted. And this was taking into consideration any sports, um, any special activities take place prior to the beginning of school, um, just making sure that um, you get timely notification of the zone exemption being uh, granted or denied. We also um, have the language down at the bottom of just where the copies go. So again, any language that was added is in red. Anything that has a strike through is uh, language that we're proposing would be deleted. This is Hope, and I have a couple of questions. Okay. Go ahead. First of all, thank you to Ms. Sanchez and Ms. Perk for assisting on all of these policy drafts. It's much appreciated that you put the time and effort into it. A couple of questions. I remember the transfer request used to be done at the school building level. I'm just curious, is it working out better having parents do the transfer request at district office rather than the school they're seeking enrollment at? One of the issues, uh, Ms. Morales, we faced with that is it sends to the, to, to the superintendent's office. Then I got a call back to the building principal. Then they have to check their numbers or class sizes or English class, math for the middle and high school. So it actually takes a longer process when in reality it's going to happen back at the school site itself. And it gives that authority and that one less step for parents. And that's my concern. If parents want to know and they don't want to wait a week, they don't want to wait two weeks, and that's what some of the turnaround time was. And um, that was the reason to get this back in place with the addition of uh, six and seven uh, on that. Also, I'd like to point out that it's very nice to see that, that we are putting the revision dates on the bottom. I know Mr. Edwards has talked to me about that before, that we start getting our revision dates back on our, our forms. So, Ms. Morales, I hope that helps a little bit. Yes, sir, that does help a lot. Thank you. And if and a I, student has been Go ahead. If Ms. a Morales. student has been given a waiver for the previous school year, will they need to reapply the next school year? No, ma'am. Okay. And last question, just for my understanding, so are the dates between May first and the tenth day of school, is that a freeze time on transfers? The first part is the tenth day of school is the request. We want to see what the numbers are going to be at, sc at the school size before the requests are honored. The May 1st, uh, I'll leave that to Mr. Hill to talk about the May 1st if zone exempt is granted for the high school 9 through 12. Um, thank you. So we visited with the director for the athletic director for the Roswell School. And we wanted to make sure that we were considering all the special activities and athletics and making sure that um, there was sufficient time for the staff and the coaches and the players to be able to get that notification. And so that we came up with that meeting first. Where it was to come up, did the extent as we're looking at this through different scenarios and um, on the sport or the special activity for we were thinking each. Um, Beach Eric, um, uh, policy. You cut out. I a think lot. I heard about Mr. You. <laughs> I think I get the gist of it, so thank you. Uh, Ms. Morales, we can get you some thank more information you. too. I apologize. It's okay. Thank you, and that's all my questions. Okay. Do we may have I, any? Uh, okay. Mr. Godlib, may I comment on the zone exempt exemption policy itself? And this is Mrs. Kirk. Yes, yes. So, um, Mr. Getty, uh, Mr. Gottlieb, in all my years in RISD, it's never been in the uh, hands of the superintendent or assistant supes or director, directors in making those zone exemption requests approved or disapproved. It's always been at the building level. So when it was taken out of their hands, it really ties principals in making those lateral decisions. And like Mr. Gottlieb pointed out, the wait time for getting those answers was phenomenal. Uh, they were waiting weeks, months to get a decision, and some never even got a decision. So after 
summer was over. So it's, it makes it very difficult when it's not at the building level. Thank you. Okay. President Giddens, so it's hope again. So I think I got a little confused with that statement. Um, this policy, though, would keep it at the district level, right? Not going back to the schools. No, it's going back to the schools. Oh, gotcha. I, that's where I misunderstood it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, anything else? All right, this is a first reading, so we'll move on to the next policy. Policy J, 3400, student interrogations, searches, and arrests. Uh, the Mr. first reading. Mr. President, did I miss one? Yes, no, you did not. Okay. Mr. President, members of the board, as I have been reviewing the board policies that we have in place, um, there were some issues that I had with the lack of clarification for administrators uh, in allowing searches to go on in the building and the authorities and what things need to take place. I did run this through the attorneys and then I gave it to Mr. Trujillo to run it through uh, uh, Ms. Sanchez and Ms. Ms. Uh, Kirk on this issue, which is really helps because they've both been teachers and they've both been building principals. So they bring the aspect to the board of what it's like to be that building principal when, a, when an officer comes in and know exactly what to do under the heat of the moment. Now, I was very concerned that we didn't have specification and there'll be um, several more policies down the road that we will need to work on this where the, where the principals have more guidance. With that being said, I'll turn it over to Mr. Trujillo. So 100, again, is for the student interrogation. The language in red is language that um, we are adding. If you notice, we tried to make it a little bit more user blind uh, with bullet points. Um, what to expect, um, when something like this happens in your school, we want, to, we want to make sure that the principals have a guide to refer to that is um, you know, easy to understand and easily accessible that we are thinking of what is best for students and their families. And so you'll notice the language, the language is being added in to help both the principal as well as the child. And um, we've also added the form, the um, arresting officer or the um, the in the investigation also have the um, follow-up reports. Is there, are there any questions? Yeah, I got some questions. Go for it. Okay, I know this is our first reading, but I think that uh, what, certificate, certificated. That's what I, I was, I was right there with you, James. That was going to be my question, certificated. Oh. I've never heard yeah, that word. Okay, that doesn't sound right. Certificated <laughs> school person. I have no idea, and I, now I've gone away from it. So, can you help me tell me where that is, and then we can all look at it. Yes. Uh, who may five. search? It says who may search. Yeah, who may search? This is not numbered. And I've got I've got another issue besides the the the, the wording. Uh, it says are authorized persons to conduct conduct searches when a search is permissible, except for below. An authorized person who is conducting a search may request the assistance of some other person who upon consent becomes an authorized person for the purpose of that search only. So that could be anybody. That's pretty vague. I'm trying to find that. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you. Here it's page... No pages. No. Well, page two. Look, maybe it's on page two of yours after the I'll application. I can show it to you. I'll scoot this over for you. It's right there. Who may search? Who may search? Okay. Yeah, right there. You got it. The, the first word. Certificated. Yeah, I've never, I've never heard that. That came before. from the attorneys, by the oh way. Oh, my goodness gracious. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that language, 
you know, again, that language was towards policy. Um, you know, we use the school board association, school board language. That was not changed, so that is part of the original language. That's just the original what language. Was added, never... of course, what is read. That is a weird word. We also removed the school bus drivers. We also okay, removed, but, uh, see that we threw the language on school. But what I'm, what I'm, what I'm kind of confused with is certificated school personnel and school security personnel are authorized persons. So are you, are you talking administrators? Are those the certificated personnel? Administrator. Or is it just a school teacher? Is so it, it, could any, be it could be a principal. It could be who? Mm. Mr. Edwards, let, let me do, since this is a first reading, let us, and that, that's not new, so I'm going to have no, to check No, that's that. not new. That's I, not new, but it's a good question, Mr. Edwards. Uh, we will get back to you on that. I think that is a great question to ask exactly. Uh, the school pers security personnel is pretty direct, so we will find out on that second part. Mm -hmm. I, I, excellent question. And then I, and, and I'm, I'm concerned with uh, an authorized person who is conducting a search may request the assistance of some other person who upon consent becomes an authorized person for the purpose of that search only. So it could be the janitor, it could be a maintenance person. It could just be, that's pretty vague to me. Okay. We'll uh, work on, look up some language on that, run that by, um, mm -hmm. that portion by the attorney again. I, I looked up the word, Mr. Edwards. It's real. It's it means real. It means somebody holds a certificate. It's different <laughs> than certified. It's certificated. Okay. I've never heard it. Yeah. But First time. Yeah, I had never heard that. I just, but I was just more concerned with you can have a. So, yeah. so is that a teacher or is that administration? Because teachers are certified too, right? Teachers are certified. Cert teachers are yes. certified. Now, are they certificated? Well, according to if they have a certificate, they are. They're. They're. That's what the word means. <laughs> I and, agree with okay. the points that Mr words is making I think it'd be good if we can help define who that authorized person can be yeah I think so too yeah and, and the other well, however I, I think yeah. it's in I think it might be important to as we as we sit here and think about this is we're at what situation can some other person be the person that's right there if if it's a kid and there's something that might be in the backpack or something that needs to be addressed right now do you have time to go find somebody else to help with that? And if you don't, then, then upon consent, if any person can, that, that's, I says upon consent. So I think it's okay, but, but I understand mm -hmm. your question, but I also want to take into account that our schools, there are times when it's, when it's hard to find an administrator or a teacher right there. Oh yeah. Uh, if it's a female, and uh, you have you need a female, you so I. And, those are just my thoughts. And Mr. Getty, you're exactly right. Having been put in that position before, when I had to search a female uh, student, I needed another female in the purse in the office with me. So that became the person that was going to be the authorized person to help me conduct that search. Not that they did anything, but other than standing there and witnessed. And any time I did that, and I think it's still um, very prudent of us, we have them sign I lost the conviction. We have Hello? them sign off. Hello? Right. Okay. Uh, I think... Ms. Sanchez, did you have something? Ms. Kirk, that was good. That's Thank that's you. exactly no. what I'm saying. Ms. Sanchez? Uh, no, I just lost you guys for a minute there. Oh, okay. I hear All a right. Single thing. Mr. Edwards? Well, 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 I'm still concerned with an, off, an authorized person who's conducting a search may request the assistance of some other person. That could be anybody. Well, it, it could be, Jane, uh, Mr. Edwards, it could be, and that's important because if... If you are conducting a search, and let's, I mean, I, I don't want to 
What if somebody said there's a gun in a backpack? And you don't have time to go find another certified person, but there's, right. there's, there's a janitor right there. So you pick huh. some other person to witness this search and it has to be done right now. Okay. That's, that's where I think, that's why I think it's worded that way. And I don't want to be, be, okay, I'm sorry, but I don't want to belabor the point, but you know, as it is, you have what they call collective bargaining. And the first thing a janitor is going to say, or a maintenance person is going to say, that's not my job. It's not in the purview of my, of my duties. Well, they might. And that's fine. You don't force the issue with them. But then at that time, you could get on your radio and call for some backup and hold the student in your office while that backup oh. came. Okay, it's no problem. I'm just going through it. I'm reading it. Uh, Mr. Edwards, we and, will get some clarification yeah. and maybe some better wording on that. I agree. And okay. this is Hope. I just wanted to share one piece of opinion. When we talk about some other person, I think the only concern I really have is making sure that it's not a minor or not a student. Right. I think um, it may not be a certified teacher, but having an adult within the building be that additional person and not having a student participate is important. Well, that I think that's why the word in there is authorized person, not child or well, it, Yeah, authorized. but what it says is they could pick some other person who upon consent becomes an authorized yeah. person. So it could be, and who, that's yeah, so we have, I, I get some, we could have some clarity there. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll uh, revise that for second reading. Cool, thank you. Anything else? We're coached with administrative. Okay, so that's just a first reading. So we have another one, I-7350 graduation requirements. First reading. Mr. President, members of the board, this is just updating our graduation requirements that, uh, again, should have been brought back uh, several years ago regarding the year changes, which is in red. Uh, the 28 credit units we have been having, what was stated in the board policy was the issue of uh, the state, when we had the state school board policy, and as a district, we have 28 credits because it expands our CTE and number of electives that our kids can take. Uh, within the school, there are four years of high school, so we stand for any questions. So, Mr. Gallo, this is not a change from what we're implementing already? No, ma'am, it's not a change. It's just, was, it was, I guess they called it administrative procedure versus board policy, but I prefer it to be in board policy because I am not allowed by law to, cre to give credit. Only the board is allowed to give credit and I, I prefer that to stay in the board's hands and uh, the process that goes forward. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Okay, anything else? All right, that's a first reading, so we'll continue on. Um, next, it looks like we have the our fund balance classification. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I recommend approval of the 2019-2020 RISD operational fund balance classification and Mr. Cole is online for questions. Are there any questions? All right, if not, may I have a motion to approve? This is Hope, so moved. Okay, I have a motion. Second. I have a second made by Ms. Kirk. Um, Roll call, please. Ellen Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? Yeah. Okay, uh, next we have the part-time employee benefits resolution. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, this is something we have to do every year. Uh, I recommend approval of the FY21 part-time employee benefit resolution, and we have Mr. Cole online again. Okay, do we have any questions? This is Hope, and I have just two quick questions. Do we have a lot of employees that work fewer than 15 hours within the district? Uh, no, ma'am, thank you for the question. Uh, generally, we have 
approximately two to eight. Uh, in, in the last 10 years, we've had approximately two to eight employees in a given year. That can change slightly from year to year as we uh, do hiring and, and as people retire and so forth. Uh, but I would just reiterate the that to do a part-time benefits resolution is required in order to offer that benefit to those staff. Um, and so over the years, they have received those benefits. Um, and of course, uh, if approved, we would send this uh, to our ERISA uh, insurers and uh, our payroll and our HR department as well. Thank you. And last question, do we have a pathway or system in place that helps us identify quality part-time employees to help them either move up to a full-time position or increase the number of hours that they're able to work? Wow, I think that's a great question, and I don't believe we do. I think that's a uh, probably an HR question, but uh, from my experience, I, I've never heard of, of that. I, I know that uh, typically we don't have very many of them, um, and I'm trying to think of some specific examples uh, over the years. Um, where either a really difficult to find uh, pos position or certification and maybe the person couldn't work uh, full-time, uh, those instances we typically don't make a habit or we haven't in the past uh, of uh, bringing on part-time uh, certified employees, but it's, it's not unheard of. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Okay, anything else? All right, then do I have a motion to approve? This is Hope, so moved. Do I have a second? So moved. Kirk. Thank you. Uh, roll call, please. Alan Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? Yeah. All right, next we have uh, fiscal year 2020, Sydney Gutierrez Middle School Operating Budget. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I recommend approval of the school year 2020, Sydney Gutierrez Middle School Operating Budget. Uh, we have Mr. Andreas online, we have Maria's online, and we have Mr. Cole online for any questions from the board. Any questions? Um, there was nothing attached in board book. Are we going to be receiving a presentation of the budget? Or how do we get information? I did I don't have it in my thoughts either. This is Ms. Sanchez. I didn't have it at the time. Oh. Okay, so you didn't have it at the time. No, Mr. Cole. Since we did not have time at, at publishing of, of this, should we yes, also sir. move this to our special board meeting so it's, it's done? Or can... Yes, sir. No, sir. So uh, we're, we're ready to go with the Cindy Gutierrez Charter School uh, budget. The presentation has been sent to Royce Braggs. Uh, so it, it should be available on the screen. Maria is here to walk us through. Maria Hernandez uh, is here to walk us through the presentation. Uh, and, and so if you'll bear with us uh, as, as we kind of get started here, this is the first time we've done it this way, and, and we sure appreciate you, um, uh, your patience. I can see it on the screen now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Maria, please. Yes, good evening. Board President Getty, members of the board, Mr. Gottlieb. This is Maria Hernandez, business manager of Sydney Gutierrez Middle School. This is the operating budget for school year 2020-2021. Slide two. Sydney Gutierrez Schools is an authorized Roswell Independent School District Charter. The middle school attendance is comprised of 66 students in grades 6 through 8. The elementary school attendance will be compromised of 130 students, grades K through 5. Student enrollment is selected by lottery method. The lottery determines student enrollment and waiting lists. 
Sydney Gutierrez manages and controls the school's revenues, expenditures, and cash balance. Slide and I'm through. sorry to interrupt you, Maria. Is there any way you all can also email us this presentation? Looking at it online, it's not clear. Yes. Thank you. Sydney Gutierrez um, has their own um, governing council, which sets its own school policies and internal pol policies to correspond with New Mexico statutes. RISD receives 2% of the charter's annual SEG revenue to cover the administrative costs of handling the school's revenue receipts and banking. This is determined by the current unit value. The amount this year will be $36,845.68. Sydney Gutierrez is invoiced monthly for the opportunity to access current RISD bids financial information, accounting, and other district offered services. Sydney Gutierrez School will have a total of 387.189 program units next school year. And this was based on the projected student membership of 186 students. We were being conservative, but we are foreseeing 196 students for the school. The total amount as Cindy Gutierrez will be budgeting from the state equalization guarantee will be $1,805,438.30. Projected salaries and benefits are $1,426,209 for the fiscal year. This accounts for 76% of Cindy's initial SEG revenues. Slide five. Here is a breakdown of Cynics Gutierrez um, expenditures classified as salaries, benefits, professional services, which um, capture the legal, professional services, professional development, um, plant services is the maintenance and repair. Um, copy machine rentals, utilities, and lease payments. Other services are um, other contract services, such as um, the poet that comes into the school for the students or student or teacher travel. Insurance is also included in this classification. Supplies is anything related to the classroom. And um, capital outlay is our supply assets, which is anything that is um, tagged, which is kept in inventory. Slide six. Here you can see the breakdown of the cost by cost descriptions salaries and benefits, which is the 76% of the budget, um, anticipated insurance payment, our accounting fee, program costs, any, any costs related to the classroom, um, service contracts, utilities, building lease, and any other is on the other um, classification. Slide seven. Here is just a projected um, budget in a pie chart. You can um, see where salaries and benefits take up most of the anticipated SEG. Program cost is the next high co higher cost related to this. Slide eight. In addition to the SCG, Sydney has other, um, a few sources of um, funding for their budget. As you can see, there's um, the Challenge Foundation, the Walton Family Foundation, 
they also receive um, the GOB library funds. Um, they do receive some um, donations which go into the private direct grants. Um, they have applied for pub, um, lease assistance. So we're anticipating and receiving funds from them. And then they have their SB9 local and SB9 state match funds. But as you can see, the majority of the budget is the SCG. So total budget for um, Sydney Gutierrez is $1,927,373. Slide nine. Sydney Gutierrez will be submitting their budget to New Mexico PD on May 21st and was presented to their governing council and approved yesterday, May 11th. Are there any questions? Any questions? All right. Um, if there isn't any discussion, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. This is Hope. Do I have a second? Second is Kirk. Thank you very much. Roll call, please. Ellen Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards? Yes. Okay. Uh, next, we have uh, an RFP 2008 recommendation scoring and supplemental information. Uh, before I give you my recommendation board, one of the things that I found out when I came aboard is uh, K through 3 did not have a, a a phonics program, a structured literacy, they call it program. Uh, this really leads to a deficit across the district in a standardized based program as kids move around, families move around from school to school. Uh, grade to grade, uh, teachers are, as you well know, because you've heard from the staff, pulling from everywhere trying to figure out what they need for the classroom. Uh, so this is one of the items that I had put forth uh, as soon as I found this out that we needed a high quality and that's one of the issues that has been uh, really pressed on to us from the State Department is high quality. Um, so at this time we do have Carla Steinhardt, Jennifer Cole on the line. Uh, Mr. President, uh, members of the board, I recommend approval of the RFP 20-08 uh, recommend scoring and supplemental information. Do we have any questions or discussion? This is Hope. I have a couple of questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you to Ms. Steinhardt and Ms. Cole. They've answered some of my questions already. Um, I'm happy to see on the scoring sheet that two of our vendors really rose to the top as those quality programs, but there was only a difference between two points between the two programs. And it seemed like even the evaluators were a little split between the two programs. So considering now the blended learning that's taking place, um, Ms. Steinhardt or Ms. Cole, does one vendor over the other offer stronger resources to support a blended learning environment? This is Carla Steinhardt, President Getty, Superintendent Gottlieb, and members of the board. I'd be happy to answer that question. Please, Carla, go ahead. Okay, so when we went into this, uh, to our structured literacy uh, RFP, the top two programs that, rank, that came to the top were both amazing programs. And what ended up happening when we invited those two vendors to walk us through the, their programs, what happened was uh, one program ended up having additional manipulatives very laid, well laid out instructional routines. When we did our research on the programs, they had been considered core programs both for understructured literacy in the state of Colorado and Louisiana Believes, also rated all green in Ed Reports. So 
and we felt that with the number of new instructional materials that we were asking for the teachers to go through, while both programs were absolutely top notch, we believed that the, our recommendation would actually be a, a, a little more, that the routines, the instructional routines were laid out in a way that uh, would be easier for teachers to be able to implement in their classroom. Okay, do we want to see the presentation that you guys have for us? I'd be happy to share with you our journey. Yeah, let's, let's, let's see that. And then, so that would have been a good thing to do before I asked if there were any questions. So sorry. Okay, Royce, could we go to slide two? So the purpose, one of the big purposes, as Mr. Gottlieb stated, was that we did not have a current uh, structured literacy uh, phonics program within our district and had been identified by our, our literacy cadre early on as the number one need in our district. We don't currently have a, a program in place that is structured that falls in compliance with the new, the new New Mexico dyslexia law, which includes daily instruction and structured literacy professional development for all elementary teachers in structured literacy and for our first grade students to be screened for dyslexia by fall 2020. Uh, slide three, please. As you can see from our current data, Mr. we Lewis, have not yes. really Lewis, moved. Number three. Slide three. We have not really moved the bar over the last three years in elementary. We see some places up and down. It is, um, you know, some years we go up, but really not a very big significant sh shift in our outcomes for ELA. But what is interesting, as we'll see on the next slide, on slide four, please. is that the current research in the science of reading is telling us that 5% of our students learn to read effortlessly. 20 to 30% learn to read easily with the most effective method, with just pretty much any, any way that we choose to teach them. So we're looking at about 30 to 35% of our student population, regardless of how we teach them, that it will be proficient, which is indicative of the current results we are getting in our, in our reading outcomes. Then we have the population of students, the 30 to 50 percent that, that learn to read is really difficult and they need systematic explicit instruction. And then even beyond that, 5 to 20 percent of the students who reading is one of the most difficult and challenging tasks that they will face throughout their schooling. And even though we have amazing teachers in RISD, even the most competent teacher cannot be successful in teaching reading, especially those students who are at risk or struggling with literacy, if they are not provided with adequate instructional and appropriate instructional materials and approaches. And that's from the M, from IDA 2019. Next slide, please. So why did we go forward with an RFP? Well, the main reason is because we are a mid-adoption cycle. We, uh, our, we, our current RISD philosophies and instructional delivery systems are in alignment with the scientific knowledge of how students learn to read. Uh, we also have a new law in the state that requires us to use structured literacy. Uh, our currently adopted ELA instructional materials, we did not adopt at the elementary level at the last ELA adoption. And what we have right now is not green on ed reports. It's not considered what uh, the state is calling high quality instructional materials. Uh, uh, so they, and our instructional materials don't currently support our teaching workforce, which includes, we have a lot of non-traditionally trained teachers. We have the long-term substitutes in early grades, and we really needed to have a program to support that differentiation and knowledge base and teaching experience for all of our students. Additionally, the foundational skills in the early years of elementary are one of the biggest predictors of later academic success, and we just really didn't feel like we could wait for the next adoption cycle in 2022 
to move on this crucial component for our students' education. Slide six, please. So this was my first time going through an RFP. I have been through many, many adoption cycle committees, but through this process, uh, I, I worked very closely with Chris Tweet on how to go about writing and developing an RFP. And so we identified the required components. What was it that we were looking for so that we were sure we were in alignment with the state and their expectations for structured literacy? Then we ad identified the committee. The committee uh, was an open, uh, I, I solicited uh, all of the schools for participation, particularly with teachers who had a background in either letters training, Orton Gill Gillingham, or uh, perhaps letters training, uh, anything with structured literacy. I, I did reach out to specific schools without representation, um, but the, you can see that, that we ended up with a committee of six. We determined how we wanted to score and align the, re the required com components in the rubric by consulting with all of the elementary school principals. So they all had a hand in identifying and helping us with the rubric with which we would use to score. We then solicited for the, uh, the proposals. We had seven programs that were reviewed and scored by the committee. We met, we, we read volumes and volumes of, of, of proposals and scored them. We identified the short list of interviews and two programs that were selected for interviews and presentations based on scoring and rubric. And can I just say that both of the programs were absolutely amazing. They both have the opportunity to scale all the way through uh, beyond just the, the foundational skills, which is what we are asking for right now, to a full core program K through five when we do go to the adoption process in 2022. So our recommendation was uh, the selection of Open Court by McGraw-Hill. Next slide, please, seven. So just to give you an idea of the shifts that we are looking at in, uh, in our district, we do have a cohort, Letters Cohort 1, with 45 teachers that, uh, and I'm one of them, that are set for completion in June of 2020. We've moved to an online professional development model since we've been home. We started in October of 2019, and we are coming to the conclusion of that. We also have additional plans for uh, letters training and other structured literacy professional development in the works, and I know that PED is also working on plans to get those out and then I also just included, and this was not in your packet, but I thought it might be helpful for you to kind of see what really is the difference between structured literacy and the typical literacy practices that are producing the current results that we have, that, that we are seeing right now. And so really, structured literacy emphasizes a phoneme grapheme level approach. They, rather than whole word reading, they, they teach uh, orthographic mapping so that whenever students learn to fluently read, they can read the, the word off the page much more easily. And then they are that, that frees up that short-term memory in their brains to be able to attend to comprehension rather than struggling to try to decode words. Next slide, please. Slide eight. So looking at what it would cost for kindergarten through third grade, uh, the, the, uh, this is what open court would cost to outfit our classrooms. All of our classroom teachers with a classroom kit and a manipulative kit. We were, the team was very impressed with the manipulatives from uh, uh, open court. One of the things that Amplify CKLA did not have was they did not have a specific foundational skills program for grade three, it's more of an integrated program, and um, McGraw-Hill Open Court still did have the foundational skills separate at, the, at grade three, which was another one of the distinguishing decision-making decision factors in going with Open Court. So that concludes, uh, next slide please, uh, nine, that concludes the kind of the process and I stand for any questions. So we already had one question. Do we have any more after the presentation or comments? Yeah, I have a comment, Kirk. Carla, great work. I know how 
laborious this process is, and um, I commend you. And coming to an agreement sometimes is not the easiest because teachers get passionate about their specific program that they want. So kudos, good job, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Kirk. And before you take a vote, Mr. Mr. Getty, I do, if you've not been in the curriculum and curriculum development and textbook selection, program selection, and, and, and I used to use the word adoption, it's really to me a selection, uh, the teachers do get very passionate, as Ms. Ms. Kirk said, and I, Carla, you took this job on, I gave it to you almost within the first few weeks when I got here, and you never looked back, and I want to tell you how much I appreciate your work and effort on this and the teachers, because it is extremely difficult to pick out something and put your name on it for the entire district, but this is where we need to go. So I, I just wanted to add that point that a lot of time, a lot of effort went into this for the right reasons. Uh, as you saw, which Carla pointed out, the test scores showed exactly what the research is saying. The percentage of kids that are going to learn no matter what is what we were showing and the kids we need to be targeting and really helping with the development of reading strategies and approaches um, we weren't reaching because of the, our approach, not because of the teachers. Right. It's because of what we were doing and not providing for our teachers in the classroom. Very I'm sorry, Miss Morales. No, no problem, sir. And I was one of the teachers who often participated in the textbook selection, so I know exactly what you all are talking about. And Ms. Steiger, I may have misinterpreted the evaluator scorecards, so it's really pleasing to hear. Did you say all of our evaluators unanimously selected McGraw-Hill? Yes, we ended up that way. We went in pretty split to our, to our program evaluation interviews, uh, but I think the distinguishing factor was when we actually requested the samples on the ground and we saw what the manipulatives and what the instructional routines were with, with open court. Uh, we still have a huge place in our heart for CKLA as well because, as you know, as a former educator, the other piece that we're going to need to also work on is that whole knowledge building so that students can comprehend what they read. And, I, and, CK, and there's nobody better than CKLA and being able to do that. But when we saw what we, you know, with, with the teachers, the, with the workforce, with the, the non-traditionally trained teachers that we have on the ground, right now we felt unanimously that open court was the choice that we needed to make. Oh, thank you. That makes me feel a lot better. And one more question. It was hard to um, see the presentation online. Everything is just real fuzzy. But the data that you showed, I believe our fourth and fifth grade students reading levels are even lower compared to our kinder to third grade students. So Mr. Gottlieb, is there a chance that we might be adopting some a better program for our fourth and fifth grade students as well? Why are we limiting this to the K through third grade? Well, my first, my first uh, emphasis and uh, you're going to, excuse me, spit it out, Michael. <laughs> um, the issue I firmly believe in, and Carla, or you can step in on this issue, or Jennifer, is if we don't have our beginning skills down very strong, every year our scores, our kids' performances will not be adequately learned, so your scores are going to go down. Um, the, the issue is that this is a cost. This is a huge cost. It was not figured in the budget. I have worked with Mr. Cole and Jennifer and Carla to see where we can steal from Paul to pay Peter on this issue because it's that important <laughs> to me. Uh, if we can get this part in place first, get the structured literacy part, meet the state standards on dyslexia, get the professional development, I see I will almost guarantee you, you will have a significant turnaround in what the fourth and fifth grade teachers, and by the time you reach your middle and high school with those kids, they already have the skills in place and the teachers aren't having to go back to reteach. And that's a real concern as we move forward. So I understand your concern. I can't explain why. I don't know if there was not enough money for the English language arts adoption cycle, um, why they did not move towards elementary. I can't answer those issues. I just know right now 
this is what we can afford. We need to do two years of this. So by the time you get to the year 2022, you can fall in line and step and hope and pray that the budgets from the state of New Mexico have increased for the language arts adoption because it's the most expensive selection of curriculum uh, that the state faces um, every five years. So um, if we can get our kids and those skills and those levels up, by the time they reach fourth and fifth grade, they are, should be working on the writing skills and the fluency issues uh, moving forward. Um, Mr. Gottlieb, could I add something? Sure, Carla, please. Okay, thank you. So even we, we know that we're going to have students in third grade who aren't gonna be ready for the third grade materials that are gonna be coming in on the board with this structured literacy RFP. But with having these materials within the buildings and as we're pairing that with the professional development, we will have, even for fourth and fifth grade teachers, the, the materials and kits that we can go back and backfill some of the, the, the missing pieces that we have for those school, for, for those students. The other piece to that is that fourth and fifth grade in open court, they also have word analysis kits as they start moving into Greek and Latin roots and, and studying uh, the actual uh, word families. So, so the, the, the opportunities to expand on this program are, and to actually use even the K through three throughout the building to build some of the, fill in some of the gaps some of our students may have, I think it will go a long way in serving our students. Wonderful, thank you, Ms. Bainhart. And I wanna make a comment, Mike, I am so appreciative of you recognizing this and jumping on board to get this adopted. As we all know, in K through three, we are teaching reading, we are learning to read. And then in five, four and five, we are reading to learn. And that's the significant difference. And so this was a, well, I just kudos, Mike, this was a piece that was missed and hopefully you're right, we will see an increase in our scores. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Carla, for all your hard work, and thank you, Jennifer Cole. You're welcome. Okay, and, and, I'll, and I'll just chime in and say, I'm excited because Cora will be a kindergartner in two years. She will actually get to use this, so uh, she'll be a better reader than her older sisters and brother. I don't know. Either way, I hope not. I don't think she will. But uh, that's a challenge for her, so um, excited that you guys did this. Um, well, it'll be, be better than her daddy. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, that's easy. <laughs> oh, shoot. I'm, I'm mute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right. Well, if we don't, do we have any other discussion? Good. Then uh, do I have a motion to approve? So moved. So moved. Okay. Uh, I had Miss Kirk with a motion, and Mr. Edwards had a second. Yes. Uh, Sanchez, they Miss Sanchez, they just beat you to the punch there. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, next we have roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Roll call. Sorry. Alan Getty. Yes. Hope Morales. Yes. Hilda Sanchez. Yes. Mona Kirk. Yes. James Edwards. Yes. Okay, uh, next we have blanket authorization to record bars, temporary cash transfers for the year end cleanup. Uh, Mr. President, members of the board, I recommend approval of the blanket authorization of record bars, temporary cash transfer for end of the year cleanup. Mr. Cole is online for questions. Do we have any questions? All right. May I have a motion to approve that? that? Just, just real quick. I know that you know. Usually, we <laughs> we're happy to take it with without any questions. But just so everybody understands, um, we're we're requesting a blanket uh, uh, authorization to approve uh, 
bars and temporary cash transfers, which are loans to other funds that uh, are on a reimbursement basis. And of course, we would bring that back to the board, and that's in, in the uh, uh, blanket authorization itself in writing, uh, that we would bring those back to the board in July and or August of the new fiscal year for your final review and, and authorization. Um, but just so you know, uh, bars are, are not, uh, we're not able to do budget adjustment requests or bars uh, through the operating budget management site of the PED during the month of June. And, and just uh, with the COVID-19 closure and, and all of those things, uh, I, I've never seen a year where we've gone this late into the year and are still expending funds. Uh, so we're going to be putting out guidance on that very quickly uh, for the remainder of funds. And the problem with that is uh, that we actually allocate those funds out to the school sites and the various departments, uh, but we also give them access to move budget within line item accounts, and then we go and clean those things up uh, from the business side uh, afterwards. And so to, to go this late into the year uh, with that kind of activity going on, it exposes us a little bit uh, to some line item accounts going over budget. And we want to make sure and get those cleaned up uh, before year end to avoid audit findings on those. So we really appreciate the board uh, allowing both the district and the charter to do this. It's not the first year we've done it. We've, we've done this uh, every year that I've been here. But again, uh, I'll, I'll just point you to the month of March where we essentially lost the month of March to do a lot of the activities that we would do to, to or be working on to clean up budgets and prepare budgets and develop budgets and, and work with committee. As a matter of fact, uh, March 16th through the 20th is when we would normally have uh, the spring budget workshop. Uh, and of course, uh, at that time, we weren't even sure if they were going to, to try and do that virtually or otherwise. Now, they did come back April 10th and do a, a virtual spring budget workshop, which was really uh, a good thing. And so we're, of course, going to follow suit with our budget development committee. Um, to uh, put that out to the public. And in speaking to Superintendent Gottlieb, we're going to put that out to the newspaper as well. Uh, I've been in contact with Juno Ogle, and she has agreed to, uh, to uh, chime in on that virtual session. So we'll be putting that together very rapidly for you as well. Um, I would like to request the board's consideration of uh, a special board meeting in May either the 21st or the 22nd. Now, uh, the 22nd is a Friday, and that bumps right up to that Memorial Day weekend, which, of course, that following Monday on the 25th is a holiday uh, for a lot of folks. So I don't know if the 21st or the 22nd would be better, um, but that would allow us to do several things. Uh, one, bring the budget committee recommendation to the board. Um, also, the um, audit RFP uh, was bumped back uh, again. We lost about a month there uh, waiting to find out the approved list of, of auditors from the state audit office, all of those things. So everything has been kind of pushed back, and, and, but the deadlines remain the same. So uh, again, uh, really appreciate your consideration of both the blanket approval uh, for year-end uh, clean up transfers, bars, and also uh, your consideration of a special board meeting for that audit RFP and budget recommendation. All right. Now, is there any discussion or questions? We'll talk about meeting later, a special board meeting. We can talk about that later. Okay. All right, do I have a motion to approve? Uh, Ms. Sanchez, did you? Yes, Ms. Sanchez. Yes. Ms. Sanchez uh, was made the motion, and Ms. Kirk approved, uh, seconded. Roll call, please. Yes. Alan Getty. Yes. Hope Morales. Yes. Hilda Sanchez. Yes. Mona Kirk. Yes. James Edwards. Yes. All right, uh, next we have the elementary math 
adoption recommendation. Before we have questions, we have a presentation. So we'll do this in the right order this time. So uh, go ahead and we'll listen for the presentation. Carla. Thank you, President Getty, Superintendent Gottlieb, and members of the board. It is my pleasure to present to you a lot of blood, sweat, and tears on the elementary math adoption recommendation. It's certain this one followed more of a traditional path with, a, with an adoption during the actual adoption cycle. So uh, let's go to slide two, please. We actually began with representation, smaller representation from each school from get grades K through two and three through five. And what we did is we started with talking about what our vision for excellent math instruction in RSD before we cracked a book, before we started training on the rubric, we wanted to know what was it, what, what is it we wanted to see happen for, with math instruction in Roswell schools. So this was a collective vision statement that we came up with as a committee. In our classrooms, we aim to build mathematically proficient students prepared to meet the demands of college and career and application of mathematics in the real world. And then next slide, please, slide three. For students, we wanted them to conquer mathematics through engaging in real world problems and rich discussions building fluency and computation through practice, communicating clearly and precisely about math. We wanted them spending more time learning the most important content of the grade, persevering through challenging work and becoming active participants in math learning. We wanted them to reflect critically on multiple approaches and mathematical reasoning of self and others. Slide four. Our vision for teachers is that they would be stewards of effective, efficient, and deep math learning through engaging in real world problems and rich discussions, building fluency and computation through practice, communicating clearly and precisely about math, spending more time learning the most important content of the grade, persevering through challenging work, becoming an active participant in math learning and reflecting critically on multiple approaches and mathematical reasoning of self and others. Slide four, five. We felt it was also important that our district take an active role in the vision of our math, excellent math instruction and that the district would support the teaching and learning of mathematics by providing high quality instructional materials aligned to the expectation of Common Core, by providing the professional development for program implementation and teacher learning, that ensuring the materials we provide our teachers are explicitly aligned to Common Core with attention to coherence and sequence, to provide core instructional materials with scaffolded supports for both teachers and students. And I say for both teachers and students because we have teachers that come from a wide variety of background who also need differentiated instructional materials to meet their needs. Providing core instructional material that contain a heavy emphasis on the major content of the grade and core instructional materials with explicit opportunities for students to use mathematical practices in meaningful ways. Slide six, please. We use this vision to as the lens with which to really take a look at the instructional materials that we were provided with as we started looking at the programs. But of course, I'm going to start with the data just as I did in our, our, science, in our, our reading RFP. As you can see, our, our math results over the course of a year in third, fourth, and fifth, and this is from SBA and Tamala math trends, really have not gone very, very far. They've, they've pretty much flatlined over the years. Uh, so I, I just I think that that's important information to have as we continue to move forward with a high quality instructional materials adoption. Slide seven. We used, in order to evaluate the program, I trained the math cadre and then they in turn trained the people in their buildings to use the equip rubric, which is from the Achieve the Core website. And it attends to what the shifts are in mathematics when we move to the Common Core State Standards. That, they, that 
so there's the align the first way we score is are they aligned to the depth of the common core and there are several target areas there for you to look to, to see what we're looking for in order to score the key shifts and the key shifts in the Common Core in mathematics were focus on the major content of the grade. That means we don't start third grade with a review of addition and subtraction. We start off the bat in multiplication because that is the, the focus of the grade. The coherence, are we making sure that rather than picking and choosing standards uh, you know, randomly, we are building the, a very coherent framework that builds on each other over time and rigor, the, the depth of knowledge and understanding that students need to have in order to be proficient mathematics students under Common Core. We, we took a look, number three was the instructional supports that is provided through the program. Are there scaffolds so that in tier one, we don't move just straight to intervention, but we're able to scaffold the learners who maybe, they, they still have access to core instruction, but with maybe a, some extra help, ELL supports, bilingual supports, special education supports, intervention supports, parent supports, all of those things were taken into consideration when we were reviewing and scoring the program. And of course the assessment pieces, both formative and ongoing daily and end of unit and more um, summative type assessments. Page eight, please. We, uh, as a group, we, we reviewed six different programs. We invited them in, the small group invited all of them in to do presentations, to review their materials. And then the smaller group, because we wanted to do a deep dive in the top two, I, I told them the top two or three programs, we only reviewed programs that were all green on ed reports. Uh, so so I, I really felt going in that it was going to be hard to make a bad decision in, in as far as a recommendation in math. But the two that came to the top were Great Minds Eureka and Pearson Envision. And it's an interesting one that Pearson, that Pearson was here because that is the math program that we have currently that we have not actually received a lot of results from. However, in, in looking at the changes that they have made with Pearson that before the, the Pearson version that we have that was rated red on, on ed reports has now been submitted again for review with all of the additions and they are now very high scoring on ed re reports and all green. The other one is Great Minds Eureka which is the, the basically uh, a lot of people know that program as the Engage New York which was built from the ground up for Common Core. Uh, so you can see how the scores, so I took the scores based on the rubric, every, every grade level in every elementary school, which by the way, our, 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 our process changed a little bit when we were not able to come to school anymore and more teachers were actually able to come to the table to see the presentations from Eureka and Envision. So rather than limiting to a group of maybe five or six people from each school, I provided all of the teachers links that they could access. We had upwards of 70, 80 teachers in each of the presentations informing themselves about each of the program. Afterwards, they met as a grade level. They scored the rubric, submitted it to the principal, who then put it on a master score sheet, where I, which is where I got these, these particular numbers. So I scored them by grade level on this, on this page, and you can see, see each grade level did select Pearson and Vision, including ancillary staff, slide, eight, slide nine. I also wanted to take a look at the way that it would look by school. So looking at it horizontally across the grades, but then to also see the pockets of schools where one program over another may have been selected and how we can continue to reach out to the schools who may not have gotten the, the you know, the, their particular choice uh, supported at this time so that we can help, you know, just help them along with, with bringing them into the fold with, with Envision as well. So you can see that we did have one, two, uh, we had five schools who who did select Eureka as their top choice. 
and we had uh, six schools who selected Envision as their top choice. Slide 10, please. Along with the, the, the form, the, the, the survey or the form that I had the principals fill out with the, with the scores, there was the opportunity for them to upload comments about each of the programs. And you will see this was a very divisive issue and a lot of it happened to be, and this isn't the case across the board, but it seemed to me like there were a lot of the upper elementary teachers who absolutely fell in love with Eureka. It was not, it didn't have all the pretty bells, whistles, and shiny things that, that you know, to compare with Eureka, but the instructional routines and the procedures and the depth that was included in that program, it's absolutely astounding for, for Eureka. And so those are the comments there. And then slide 11, please. The comments for uh, Envision. A lot of people liked it because it's very familiar. While there is addition, additional content that has been added to make Envision now an, a high quality instructional materials choice, it still maintains the same type of, of lesson planning structure that they were already familiar with. And, and so that was uh, something that the teachers really liked. The other thing that teachers really liked with Envision is that it came with manipulatives. There are, there's, a, there's a lot of parent engagement type activities. So there was uh, just a lot of components that were supplied with Envision for the prize. Slide 12, please. The price for both programs were very similar. The, it's a very simple pricing structure for Envision, and it's $96.97 student per student, cost per student for life of the adoption, and that includes all uh, consumable materials sent for the life of the adoption. And so you see there the price for elementary math adoption. Next slide, please. So upon your approval, I, I'm, I'm really hopeful to get started with some, some professional development so that we can start off the ground running uh, this next year with, you know, either through K, in K-5 plus and for sure in August so that we can have the, our professional development, our teachers trained and get started right away. And, all, and, not just, and not just professional development the first year, but really for the life of the adoption, onboarding new staff and deepening pedagogy throughout the, throughout the adoption, I think is very, very important. And that is the end of my presentation and I stand for any questions or comments. Um, okay. Questions, comments? <laughs> this is Hope. And Ms. Steinhardt, thank you again for leading this process. I understand the time and energy that you and everybody put into it, so thank you for that, and thank you for answering some of my questions earlier on. Um, I want to ask the same question just because um, we're not in the same place that we were in January. Right now, some of our teaching and learning may be done in a blended learning model. Do you feel confident with the online resources that the program is offering? Absolutely, and that's one of the big additions to all of the instructional materials that we're actually seeing that are cro that, that crossed our paths. Some things that are noteworthy is on the teacher planning pages, they actually have uh, teacher professional development embedded right there in their planning stages so that they can understand uh, better how to use the instructional routines what the possible misconceptions that students could do. And I could really see that as a benefit for teachers as they are honing their craft in, in the program. Additionally, a lot of the content is available online and you can actually see all of the online components because uh, they are, are fully open right now with the COVID-19 through, uh, I think it's Success Bridge or Easy Bridge, one of the, the Pearson components. So the, the, the online components for all of them, including the, the RFP for structured literacy, there's a lot of opportunities for students to engage online as well. Thank you. And I have one more question because all Mr. Gottlieb can do is really tell me no. 
Um, when I look at the state rankings for the different curriculum programs, it looks like Eureka is actually a better program to serve our kindergarten through second grade students, and Envision Math is stronger to support our third through fifth grade students. Is, it an, is there a possibility for us to adopt two different programs, one for K through second and one for third through fifth? That was actually a question that the committee asked, but it was in, in the reverse in our district. There was probably more teachers in the upper grades that really liked uh, the Eureka and more in the lower grades that liked um, uh, Envision, although there were exceptions to that as well. And so is that a possibility for us to adopt two different curriculums? In, in general, Ms. Morales, the answer is not really because you lose your continuity of program from grade to grade and you get your vertical and horizontal alignment. Um, to be quite honest, since I was not in at the beginning of this, I was very fortunate to hit what I hit four or five of your meetings, Carla, something like that. Um, it only gave me a quick overview. I learned a lot about the technology portion part of it when I did come in. Uh, Carla or Jennifer, would you like to expand on, on that issue? Because I did not get to be part of that whole presentation. So Carla, if you want me to add on here, I, I do know about uh, the Envision, Envision that um, it, it, you can do, so for the blended learning, it's 100% online or in print. So we can go either direction with that. And I believe on the PED's website, and Carla, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, Envision was ranked number one overall. Actually, there was some late additions to that, and Zern ended up with a higher score. But when um, we actually had, had them come twice, but they did not have their materials available in Spanish. And so that was a, the deal breaker there. Yeah, that's, if we can't meet the SWD and, and the bilingual portion of it, I would have a hard time on that because that's part of the high quality issue that the state is asking us to look at. And also, go ahead, please. Go ahead, Hope. Okay. No, it was just one last comment. I was a little concerned because our data has not looked very good overall, and Envision is the program that we've used. So I'm definitely, I'm, I'm going to be open-minded and hopeful that something has changed. I just, again, it's just an area of concern that we're adapting the same curriculum that we've used the past several years, and our data has not been let, very strong for math. Let me and that's it. Thank you. No hope. Let me address that. So I hopefully I can get this for you. The problem with that is. Uh, Common Core was not the, the standards that we were measuring at that time when that math selection was selected and fully implemented across the state. Now, of course, as you well know, uh, the unfortunate part is uh, they keep changing the math test. So it's a moving target. If they would keep some consistency, we'd really able to put some fingers down on where exactly we're missing the boat. Uh, in our classroom instruction uh, and helping teachers uh, with what they need in the classroom. Uh, from, what I, from what I did understand and did gather at the one presentation is that I was able to hit on that part is it has completely been aligned to the Common Core and the necessary related standards within this, that portion of Common Core. So Carla, can you expand on that portion for us? Yes, I, I, I think I can. The, there, there, the, some of the lessons are the same, and I think that when teachers see, oh, well, it's the same picture, it's the same activity, it may not be in the same unit or where it was before, but they, I think that they've really gone back to looking at the coherence, focus, and rigor, which were the shifts in Common Core. The, 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 version that we were using was Envision 2013, which uh, all of the, the related reports did not include it in high quality instructional materials at the time, um, mainly because it did not attend to the shifts in Common Core. But as, as Mr. Gottlieb did allude to, it was we were still very new to Common Core at the time. 
So since the inception of Ed Reports and the importance that districts and teachers place on instructional materials adoption using that, that report, publishers have had to really step it up to, to, to get that gateway. Ed Reports does not take any kind of, of uh, financial, they're, they're a nonprofit, they are, they are funded, I think they might be a, a Gates Foundation, um, but they don't take any money from publishers. Uh, so it's it's a badge of honor to actually wear all green on Ed Report. So I am hopeful. I obviously have not seen all of the things. I share your concerns, uh, uh, Ms. Mrs. Morales. I one of mine also is the amount of material that comes with the adoption and how easy it could be to differentiate your way from core instruction. And so that's something that as we are in our implementation process, we're really going to need to keep a keen eye on that we don't intervene our way away from core instruction. So that's what I have to say about that, I guess. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, I have a quick question. So when we start looking at alignment with the state assessment, Mike, are we going back to the scope and sequence and the uh, pacing guides? Uh, Ms. Kirk, one of the things that we, what I have on my agenda for us to start working on, unfortunately my timeline within the district is, will not be long enough to make all those things happen, but the, the issues of the scope and sequence, the, uh, the vertical and horizontal alignment, uh, pacing guides need to be brought back to the district. Uh, that, that took many years to get in place and an update yearly uh, that was let go for quite some time. Uh, one of the issues, as you know, we're facing, um, and I've talked to Ken Bluey about this a little bit, is that we're going to another new assessment. Uh, it, it makes it extremely difficult for our teaching staff um, to know exactly what they're going to be assessed on, what the kids are being assessed on, what, what the essential skills that our state wants our kids to know. But I think if you get back to that scope and sequence, your pacing guides, uh, your vertical and horizontal alignment, and that's the part that concerns me with Hope's question, is that once we have those back in an alignment process, your learning strategies should not depend directly on just the assessment. Uh, you, you can then move that guidance yearly as you move forward, so as you change assessment. So yes, yes, Ms. Kirk, that's, that's my goal is to get those things started and that process started, but it's a reteaching of staff on that whole process, and I don't have Pat Weaver anymore. And as you know, Pat was brought to us by the University of, of Arkansas, probably one of the top professors in the United States on pacing guides, scope and sequences, worked with well over 200 teachers uh, on that process yearly. It was quite an in-depth process. So we'll work on it and we'll start the process and we'll move forward. One other thing issue for the board is somewhere along the process, the board selection slash adoption uh, was not part of the process. Information was given but it was not the process. I would like to get back to all these items be under the board's authority and control so they know exactly what we're doing and the processes we're using in the classroom because when the final bell rings, it falls on to the board. So that's why we're having these very long presentations tonight because we need to know what the board is saying, how they're feeling and the questions that they come up and so questions as we move forward with selection of a curriculum, and we'll be bringing the pre-AP and AP also to the board, um, is that they have an idea of what's going on and that we know what questions they're going to ask us so we can move forward. Um, with that being said, Mr. And President. I, yes, Ms. I Roll. think that is definitely a needed piece, Mike. It has been missing for quite some time, and we have been left out of that loop. But like you, hopefully though, as you pass on your knowledge to our assistant soups and our directors, then they'll be willing to push that forward, um, making sure that those scope and sequences 
and that vertical and horizontal alignment is there. It, Thank you. It only works though if you have principals and teachers involved though. We can't, we can't develop it here at central office to push it out. The teachers who do the work have to be involved in that process. So I thank you, uh, Ms. Kirk, on that issue. With that being said, Mr. President, uh, I recommend- Mr. Gutland. Yes, ma'am. I apologize, sir. I have one last question. Will the district be aligning our CIAs to the new curriculum? CIA, help me. Um, our district assessments, I think they're done quarterly. Will we, be, will we do a realignment for the new curriculum that we're adopting? It's the common interim assessments, and my answer would be yes. Okay, thank too, you, Ms. Steinhardt. Too many acronyms since I've been added back in seven years, but uh, yes, Mr. Bluery will be working on that with us too. Thank you, and I'm done, sir, thank you. No problem. Um, Mr. Getty, members of the board, I request approval of the elementary math adoption recommendations. Do I have a motion? So moved. I think I have a motion for Ms. Kirk and a second for Ms. Sanchez. That's correct. Roll call, please. Yeah. Allen Getty? Yes. Hope Morales? Yes. Hilda Sanchez? Yes. Mona Kirk? Yes. James Edwards. Sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, that's the end of the action item. So we're gonna start with reports, Mr. Gottlieb. Uh, Mr. Members, uh, board members, Mr. Getty. Uh, first of all, I wanna thank you all for your questions tonight. I think it's critical that the board gives the us direction and things to be looking at as we move forward. Um, I really want to thank the staff this year, all the staff, for the for the um, stress that they've been under for a variety of reasons, and I really appreciate the hard work that they've put in, particularly since we've had the, the, the virus issue and the amount of time and effort they have put in online, making packets, looking at stuff, making phone calls, and all of those things. It's it's. You, they represent the board well, and I just want to get that thank you out again. Um, again, Carla and your group for both adoptions, I want to thank them for that. That has been an important issue. I'd like to thank the board for helping us with our graduation and giving us permissions. If we don't get our regular in May, that you gave us permission to go ahead and look at June and July. I think that's a great way to honor our kids if we can do that, and we'll follow the law but I want to thank the board for letting us provide that. Um, also for the board letting us do the bulletin board, electronic bulletin board. Um, that has been well received and we're working on it real hard. Uh, Abby and uh, Jerry have been working very hard with several staff trying to get that pulled together so we can start showing that come the 18th. Um, I also would like to thank the board for going with me at three different times, breaking up in groups to go look at Dylan Norty. I know that's a, that's a big chunk of time of your day to go visit the school, um, to look at the progress so that you can see how you're expanding public money and whether you uh, have questions or concerns as you see those projects being built. I know Mr. Edwards had an issue he would like to bring up tonight uh, regarding the um, parking area across south from Del Norte. So I, I told him I would remind him tonight so he could bring that up. He does have a question on that. Um, All right, uh, do you want me to talk about it? Yes, sir, if you would, please. Okay, now during our tour, which was a pretty good tour, long tour, you know, we have, a, we have a lot of property that the, that the district owns. One of those properties is right directly across the street from, the, uh, from Del Norte, and it's an open lot. Most of you probably saw it. It's to the, I want to say it's to, is it to the- South. To the south, south side building. And pl there's plenty of parking. And I noticed that when I pulled up. A lot of space. It would per work perfect for overflow parking for staff, uh, which would free up some of the other parking. 
it, would, it also would probably alleviate a lot of that traffic that's going to be on that road. Uh, and it's not being utilized. It's good, it was good enough for me to park my car there. I don't see why it wouldn't be utilized. We need to utilize everything, all of our resources that we have right now. Because you're going to run into a problem with, well, it's not a problem. You're still going to have people that are going to go and park where they want to park anyway. But if you give them that opportunity to, to park their car to the south of that school, I think it would alleviate a lot of the issues that, 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 that are going to arise. Uh, it's good parking. It's not paved. But, you know, I brought that up to Mr. Gottlieb when we were there during our tour. And I was like, wow, that would be, that's a nice parking. Uh, I just wanted to see what the thoughts were from the other board members. But I think it would, it would help us in the long, long run. And I don't think it would cost us any more than what it's already cost us to, to utilize that deal because it's just sitting there. Uh, Mr. Edwards, one of the things that I would like for, to bring back to the board next month is we would have to do a, a cut in the cement and pour a correct ramp for cars pulling in the lot, a little bit, right. of, little bit of leveling and some gravel to hold down the dust because once we get in yep. that area, tracking the dirt and, and mud into the building, plus the neighborhoods with the dust as we start parking in there, uh, I'll see, I'll visit with Mr. Cole and uh, Mr. Rogers on that issue, what it would cost and what's the possibilities. Um, we hope that the state won't sweep a whole bunch of our money, particularly the money that we put in for construction. That may be a possibility down the road to use some of that money. But I, I agree with Mr. Edwards. When you look at your PTA programs at night, all those programs going, yep. you never have enough parking, ever. And that would be a way to help alleviate some of those concerns. Mm -hmm. Of course, we'd have to have the crosswalk signs painted in, those issues to make it safe. But I, I agree with Mr. Edwards that we should be using that for uh, uh, better utilization of parking. But I will bring back to the board next month uh, the curb cutting and the cement would cost to, to get a driveway entrance and then a little right. bit of leveling and some dirt, I mean some gravel in there to kind of give the board some options as we move forward. Is that all right with you, Mr. Edwards? Yes, sir. All right. We will, we will work on that for the board coming uh, this next meeting. Not the special meeting, but the one in, in June. Uh, particularly okay. Particularly so I'd like to piggyback off that. My, I had spoken to um, our chat about the sidewalk on the uh, west side of the street connecting Del Norte to uh, Goddard. So would that be implemented also? I know they use that area for parking already, parents do, but if it were graveled and, like you said, leveled and graveled, that sure would help because they also use the area to the west. But now that those houses are built there, that's, that area is desperately needed for parking, for but, overflow. But the sidewalk now is my concern. Now you brought yeah, up, but you, sidewalk, you're talking to ADA and everything else, right. so you're looking at a pretty pretty cost of pretty penny. But that's very important because now we have our kids and our families, especially our children, uh, walking from Del Norte to Goddard in the street. They are walking in the street because of the fact there's no, it's straight dirt and when it rains, it's muddy. And that has been a big issue. Okay. We'll, we'll bring back a variety of reports for the board so you have it. And Mr. D Mr. Edwards is correct. You, once you do that, you got to have your handicap, I mean your mm -hmm. ADA compliance mm -hmm. on the cement sidewalks and those things. But we'll bring something back for the board so we have a, a, a good report and you can make some decisions for us. The last thing I have for the Perfect. board is the, uh, the governor is going to make an announcement this Thursday. I still don't have the time of the announcement. I do have the day. I was just told um, via text message that the announcement will be made on uh, Thursday the 14th regarding the what, what her next stage of where we can, how many people can meet in a group, or what are the new guidelines going to be? So, I would encourage all of us to listen to her. 
hopefully we'll find a time where we can get you that information uh, so we have some better handle on whether or not our plans are accepted for graduation. Cool. Thank you, board. I appreciate it very much for this time today. Mr. Godlove, this is Mrs. Sanchez speaking. Yes, ma'am. I was going to ask, I was going to thank Mr. Call for... Uh, Ms. Sanchez, I can't understand you. Oh, okay. No, I was going to say I want to thank Mr. Cole for uh, revising the bus conduct report and adding the Spanish piece to it. Are uh, we going to approve this form tonight? No, ma'am. What I have for you is... Um, what I have for you is... Uh, which we'll need to get to you. It has the handbook in Spanish and English, the form in Spanish and English, as you request it. Thank you, Ms. Sanchez. I had it sitting right in front of me, and I forgot. So I have those to get to the board so that you can look at it. You can see what we've done. This is already done. So it's, it's one of the requests that you had us get in place. Uh, if you want to yes, make that... That's fine. If you want to make that a formal action down the road, we can absolutely do that. Um, okay. But we want to make sure that you look at it first, you get your, your approval of it, and then if there's something that you want to move as a board action from this point on, we can more than happy to do that. But I want you to look at it first. Okay. I did, I did make a copy of it, and I printed it out, and I actually have it here in my hand. And I, it looks pretty... Ms. Sanchez, looks we can't hear you again. Me. I was going to say, I did, have, I did print a copy of it uh, this evening, and it looks pretty good to me. Okay, thank you very much. I know as soon as mm -hmm. we went from the board meeting last month, I made notes of everything that you had said and gave it to Mr. Cole, and he says they'll get it done. So I appreciate your input okay. on that, Ms. Sanchez. Um, we do have the personnel report, Ms. Trujillo. Yes, I find you. You have the personnel um, report month of April ending May 6th. We have had very few hires and trappers. I mean, this month will be uh, much busier. We normally have a lot more of the retirements and resignations coming through. Um, but with COVID-19 um, situation, it is put behind think. Um, but uh, I, I stand for any questions on the, on the report. If not being said, we'll move to the general ledger. In addition. Question? Mr. Cole? I was just going to say that in addition to that, I'd like to add that with our recruiting efforts, have been to do some virtual fairs. We've reached out the um, state schools here for each one is certified in the area open. Um, our recruiter, Louis Mestres, is doing a job in collaboration with our principals. So we are a non-conventional method trying to fill those seats that we have. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Rio. Mr. Cole, General thank Ledger. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Superintendent Gauntlet, Board President Getty, members of the board. Uh, you have there before you our uh, year-to-date revenue and expenditure report. Uh, and, and again, uh, just kind of going back to uh, the budget and working on those things, I, I did want to point out um, that in that that pushback in March or that that kind of that lost time in March. Uh, we were essentially wanting to get more information on how uh, budgets would be affected uh, by uh, oil and gas markets and, of course, the uh, closures uh, globally and, and certainly statewide. Um, so in visiting with PED, and, of course, they did have a virtual uh, spring budget workshop. Again, that was April 10th, so we did get some answers uh, there and so we are going to build this budget and are building in, in the process of building uh, next year's budget based on the laws as they currently exist uh, the 2020 legislative session and, and so uh, the problem with that uh, that and I want to make sure and give the context behind that far before we get there uh, is that uh, that was a different time and place uh, with different revenues. And, and we've recently seen May 5th, uh, the uh, 
consensus revenue estimating group, uh, which consists of the Legislative Finance Committee, the Department of Finance Administration, Tax and Revenue Department, and the Department of Transportation. Uh, again, May 5th came out with their uh, updated estimates of revenues. And, and so uh, their conclusion uh, was that current year, uh, the 2019-2020 uh, fiscal year will likely be insufficient to cover the current year's total appropriations uh, for budget. And, and without changes in spending, mean decreases in spending, or the authorization to use other reserve funds, um, the, the outlook gets a little worse when you start looking at next year uh, and the year after. Uh, the, the quote as much as a 20 percent, a 28 percent uh, below uh, previously estimated revenues there for next year. Um, so the outlook is good. I don't think anybody's um, naive to that. I, I just want to point it out because uh, at the end of the 2020 legislative session, uh, the outlook was really good, uh, comparatively speaking. And so there were some things built in there. There was a, a three point, uh, I believe a 3.49% increase to uh, operating SEG uh, that would cover a 4% uh, required um, annual raise uh, to school district personnel. And so we, we know those things, uh, those revenues uh, will probably in, in all likelihood be going away uh, very soon, um, particularly in a special session in June, which would be just before we close the fiscal year and start our new fiscal year. So it's really interesting, but I don't want anybody to be under the illusion uh, that, that things will hold, uh, we are going to build the budget uh, based on current laws as they exist, but knowing that there's going to be some dramatic changes uh, pretty rapidly, almost uh, right thereafter. Uh, so that puts everybody in a really tough position. I don't think anybody's to blame, and that's not my, my angle on it. I, I just want to point it out so that we're all aware uh, of that. Uh, fact. Also tonight, um, or, or following tonight, uh, we've got some signature pages that I'll be reaching out to our board members uh, to get their signatures on, specifically that resolution uh, for part-time employees, uh, the Cindy Gutierrez operating budget signature page, and then we've got a cash transfer uh, that will need a board president and superintendent signature on. So I, I will be reaching out to board members in the following days, and I'll come to you. I don't want to make it, uh, if that's okay, uh, any more difficult on anybody, but I would like to collect those signatures and, and get those things off so that we've got our people taken care of uh, when we start the new fiscal year. With all that being said, looking at the year-to-date revenue and expenditure report as of April 30th, uh, you can see there it, it's very similar to uh, previous reports. I, I just kind of want to point something out, uh, just for clarity's sake. If you look out, oh, let's see, one, two, three, the fourth column from the right, it says unencumbered balance. So if you look at that on the report, and if you'll go down six line items to the sixth line item, you'll see that there's a negative $198,977.90. So what that means is that in that particular expenditure account, we have a negative balance. Now, uh, with the bars that you approved on the consent agenda tonight, that cleans that up. Um, so that, that is taken care of, but that's just to illustrate what I'm talking about when I say we're in May and, and uh, uh, expenditure activity is still ongoing. Uh, that's the that's the big concern. Our line item accounts like that, uh, and thankfully uh, you've approved our blanket um, approval of bars and temporary cash transfers. So we will be cleaning those things up. Uh, but that's that's kind of what we're talking about. Um, 
when we're referring to those things. Uh, but you can look down at the report. I don't see anything that uh, uh, causes me uh, concern. Uh, uh, again, the items uh, such as that line item number six on the first page uh, have already been cleaned up with tonight's bars that you've approved. So we'll be posting those shortly um, to fix those issues um, going forward. And with that, unless there's a, uh, I stand for any questions. I've got a question. Yes, sir. All right. <clears throat> now, you were talking about, you know, the the, the 4% or 3.4% uh, yes. salad creep. Okay. Now, with that, how much, what's the, the increase going to be to the insurance? Uh, a little over 8%. Okay, I thought I'd, I wanted to ask that because I, I had heard that figure. Now, may I chime in and just expand on that? Because there's always, or, or in years past, there's been this um, uh, miscorrelation between the two. So when we're talking about a, a 4% increase to someone's annual salary, you're taking the annual salary times 4%, and that gives you the increase. When we're talking about an 8% to someone's insurance, uh, you're, you're, it, it's 8% against that previous insurance charge, whatever that is. They may have had the high option plan or the low option plan. My point is uh, the salary number, the annual salary number, is a much larger number than the total medical insurance cost. Uh, so a percentage of salary versus a percentage of the insurance cost uh, the percentage of the insurance cost, even though it's 8% versus 4%, is much lower uh, in terms of, of the, the total cost. Um, so if you get a 4% increase on your salary, it definitely outweighs an 8% increase on the medical insurance side. And we can certainly come up and will come up with some examples of that for the, the budget development group so that we all understand that, because I know that's that's been taken and run with in years past, and, and the correlation is not anywhere close. So, um, now, let me ask a question. I want to ask this other question. Let's say that the, the raise doesn't go through. Yes, sir. Because it, it doesn't necessarily have to go through, but does, does the insurance still go up? Yes, I, I would think so. Uh, now, what's Mr. interesting, Mr. Cole, looking at um, Mr. Cole, 2020 legislation. Mr. Mr. Cole, uh, Mr. Sir. Cole, thank you. Yes, sir. Let me uh, chime in on something that you were not privy to with our last meeting. Uh, yes, sir. Across with the superintendents and the insurance uh, adjustment. That was one of our webinars. Is that, uh, Mr. Edwards, on that issue, uh, the 8.7 is going to happen. And it's going to happen. Wow. It's going to happen for the next four years at that same percentage increase. Some of the discussion has been, well, can they cut that off or, or make it shorter? And the insurance authority that came back and said, yeah, they could, but then you'll have double digit from there on out because they got to make it up because they're trying to keep the reserves in place and keep ahead of the cost factors. So that's one of those things that it doesn't go away and there's the, the employees portion and the district's portion um, of that. And Chad, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that was, no, one no, of, it's great. that was one of those things that just recently came out in our webinar today that that is one of those uh, ongoing costs that no matter what the budget is, that's gonna go up. Wow. I it's just thought I, would, I thought I would raise that question because uh, it's it a great question, and it's got a it, yeah, yeah, Mr. yeah. It's a thank you. please go ahead. I just ahead. want to thank Mr. Edwards for asking that question. I think it's great. As much as possible, we can't really say much sometimes to the raise that teachers are going to get because of the state budget. But I want to make sure that teachers never take home less on their check than they are in previous years. So we know the insurance is going to keep going up, but we need to do our best to make sure that their take-home pay does not go down, regardless of what the teacher salary increases may or may not be. 
Yeah, I, I totally agree. I don't, I don't think anybody would disagree with any of that, and it is a great point. Uh, and really appre appreciate Mr. Gottlieb uh, uh, talking about uh, the extended years out um, factor because, uh, you know, NIPSIA, uh, New Mexico Public Insurance Authority, is a pool of all the districts in New Mexico with the exception of one that I'm aware of, and that's APS, which is by far the largest. Um, so would it help our pool if APS participated in that? Absolutely, as a state. Uh, as a district, too, it, it would help um, or should help, um, typically. Also, uh, great to uh, Mr. Gottlieb's point is uh, not just the 8.7% 8, 7, 8 increase, but the split uh, between district and employee. Um, so it, the brunt of that is, is not... Uh, uh, taken on by, by one uh, group uh, versus the other. It's taken on by both. Uh, it'll be an increased cost to the district as well as the employee, but the increased cost is split, and the split between the district and the employee, um, I'll just give you an example because it's broken out by, by tiers essentially based on how much you make. So anyone making $25,000 or more uh, is uh, the, the district's portion of that increase is 62%. And then, of course, the employee's portion is then 38%. Um, so there's that. Um, also, for our, our employees that make less than that, uh, the district's portion goes up, uh, meaning the district covers more of the cost for uh, uh, an employee that's not making 25000 or more. Um, so I think that's important to, to point out as well. Uh, again, uh, I want to put together some specific examples of that um, to arm you with uh, so that, that we can communicate that clearly uh, because I know it's been very confusing uh, in, in some years past uh, where, where the comparison, uh, they try to make a comparison of apples to apples and it's really not uh, that, that good of a comparison. Um, but yes, 8.7%. And like I said, NIPSIA is, is just like a, a district or a business or anybody else in terms of their finances. Um, we've, uh, and I, I think we need to give them some credit um, for years past where they had a cash balance and they dipped into that cash balance over the last couple of years uh, in particular to avoid uh, larger increases. Um, to the insurance uh, costs. Um, unfortunately, they've dipped into the cash balance and that is no longer uh, existent at those levels. So, uh, of course, they will have to, to raise their costs. Part of that is also uh, just the cost of insuring districts uh, in the state of New Mexico has gone up. There are a lot of reasons for that, and I won't get into those. Uh, I think they do a pretty good job uh, of getting into those themselves when they present that. But um, uh, So that is important, and uh, I, I'm absolutely with you, Ms. Morales, Mr. Edwards. Uh, we don't want people going backwards. Uh, we don't feel like... Uh, th th we don't feel like that, that's a good way to attract people. We know that we're competing with Texas, Arizona, uh, Colorado for teachers. Uh, we know that we're competing with other districts in the state for teachers. Um, so uh, we've worked really hard in, in the last few years um, to really make our salary schedules attractive um, to our, our teachers and certified staff. Um, so we'll continue to do, do those things uh, as we move forward. Anything else? I, I guess good. just one more thing, one more food for thought, and I, I hate to put it out there, but I, I, I feel like I'd be um, not, not. I always want to give you the, 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 the full scoop. I, I don't ever want you to feel like I'm not being transparent. Um, so thinking in terms of, of an average school district in the state of New Mexico or charter school, uh, they always fall within the range of, of what's, what's the, the total cost out of their operational budget. And, and you can compare almost uh, any school district or charter school, 85 to 90 percent of their budget goes to salaries and benefits costs. Uh, and so, you know, if, if, um, 
if 85 to 90 percent that that leaves you 10 to 15 percent margin um, to cover things like utilities uh, insurance costs uh, uh, liability insurance cost alone or two million dollars for a district our size um, so that 10 to 15 percent margin you still got to cover the the necessities utilities and, and, and insurance um, so really you know if if you're at 85 percent of your cost or salary and benefits uh, and five percent of your costs go to insurance and, and utilities uh, then really you're down to 10 percent so if you're looking at budget cuts uh, greater than 10 percent uh, you can do the math and you can see where that starts to cut in uh, and what it cuts into um, so uh, you know we're going to look at this very thoughtfully and very carefully and very transparently uh, but just know uh, that the decisions are always tough uh, and, and and we've seen this before in 2008, 2009 is a perfect example, uh, but we made it through and, and uh, we didn't uh, uh, have to do anything drastic uh, to get through it other than control our costs and, and manage uh, the revenue sources coming in. So that's what we're looking to do. We're looking at it thoughtfully uh, and aggressively. Um, so, uh, you know, those are the things that we're going to be bringing to the board. Um, to consider with the budget. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Gottlieb? No, sir. Thank All you. right. Um, I'm going to just, on the special meeting thing, can, can we just, can you email us a yes, couple sir. dates and uh, board try and get back as quick as possible because if, if uh, Mr. Cole wants to do this on the 21st or 22nd, we'll have to have a decision pretty quick so we can get it posted and stuff like that so um, expect an email from Julie or, or Mr. Gottlieb tomorrow okay um, and I, I put in for board communication and just keep it short I guess uh, I'm not, not too short but just that uh, it was teacher appreciation week I think last week so um, I just wanted to give a, the board an opportunity to say thank you to um, our teachers, our educators, everybody that's been involved in this process. And I, I'm going to, if it's okay, I'm going to start and then we will go right down the, uh, the list here. So it'll be me, Hope, Hilda, Mona, and James. So um, I'm just going to start and I just, you know, with this, I've got three, three children in, in the system right now going through this pandemic. Uh, and I've been very appreciative of the teachers and the staffs at, at, at all of their schools, but I know that I'm just one parent, and I am blown away when I hear about um, uh, educators picking up their phone at 9 o'clock at night for a student or having their computer on so that if a student emails them or checks on them that that they're, they're responding back. And so I'm, I'm very impressed at our district. I, um, this, this isn't meant to be mean, but, but there was, I have a friend who's, um, whose, kid, whose child goes to Gateway um, and he said something and it, I, I want you to know that it really made me mad. He said, yeah, we had all our stuff in blah, blah days. We way, we totally beat the, the public school system. And I looked at him and I said, well, yeah, because you only have so many students. <laughs> I mean, come on. We have a district of, of close to 10,000 students, around 10,000 students. And we have successfully managed to, to, to make education happen for them. And that's a lot of work on everybody's part. And I know that. But I know that the teachers have had to adjust. And so... I just want everybody to know how much as a board, for me, I will, I'm speaking for the board because I know the board feels this way, but, um, but I'm speaking mostly for me that, man, you guys nailed it. Um, this district did a great job. Our teachers did a great job. Administrators did a great job. Uh, I mean, talk about our, our, our food service providers, um, our cafeteria workers, our custodians, Everybody did something, and 
they, our kids were, were taken care of. And I'm just so impressed by that. And I, and I just, I wanna say, I appreciate you guys. I know that we're gonna end the school year as, as weird as we've ended it. It's still gonna end. And at our next board meeting, the school year will be over um, officially. So I wanna make sure that, that I said thank you to, um, to, to our entire district staff. Great job this year. Um, what an amazingly crazy year we've had. Um, and, and I mean, not just pandemic stuff, but, but before that, we had changing, uh, board change, everything that's gone on. And you know, that's stuff that, that our teachers can't control. And they still showed up for work every day. They still showed up for our kids every day. And all of our staff across the entire district did that. And so I appreciate you guys. I know it was a hard year and you guys pulled through and did amazing things. And uh, that, that's exciting for me. And I am only speaking for me, Alan Getty, but um, I will now turn the mic over to uh, Mrs. Morales if she would like to. Thank you, Mr. Getty. And I think I spoke a lot this evening, so I'll do my best to keep it short and simple. Um, to all the teachers, especially during Appreciation Week, guys, I am exhausted. So I know if I am exhausted, I know absolutely how exhausted the teachers are. Please know that we see you. We see the hours of work that you're putting in, in your classrooms at home, to adjust, to differentiate, to make sure your kids have what they need. Uh, mentally, physically, emotionally, while trying to deliver a quality education. Teachers always step up, and this time, once again, you have stepped up, and you're always focused on your students. And for that, as a school board member and as a parent, I thank you all. And to everybody within the district, I am proud and honored to work alongside the board members and for everybody in the district because it really takes a team, and I'm proud to be a part of it. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Sanchez. Yes, um, I just want to say while, while there has been many challenges and I know there's still more to come, I've been very impressed and I'm very grateful for all their efforts and all the work they've done. Um, and I think there's more, I mean, there's more to do because of the pandemic and, and I want to thank them for the support they have given our students during all this and that's I'm just happy and, and thankful for them, and I appreciate all the teachers. All right, Ms. Kirk. Well, I too echo everybody's sentiments. It's been such a crazy year with the spear fishing episode that just shut the district down for months, change in leadership, it has just been a crazy, crazy year. But teachers are resilient. Educators are resilient. It's funny how we don't even notice, and I count myself for 31 years, I didn't even notice when things changed. I knew I had a job to do, and it didn't affect my job. So I know how passionate educators are. They have a goal and they don't waver. So I, from the bottom of my heart, I thank all the educators in the district for stepping up. I too, as a parent and a past educator, I'm just so pleased to be part of Roswell Independent School District on a continuum. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Have a great summer. Um, what you can and how we can, who knows? I, it's out of our hands at this point. Thank you. God bless. All right, Mr. Edwards. Okay, caught me off guard. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say, since it's Teacher Appreciation Day or Pre Appreciation Week, whatever, uh, and this goes out to the administrators, a good administrator is as only as strong as his teaching, as teaching staff. Because without a good teaching staff, you don't have a good administrator. It's real important that our administrators take care of our teaching staff because they're hard to come by. And I do want to say thank you for the teaching staff because I've been around and I've rode around and I've seen 
some different things in the in the uh, in the schools, and the and the good leaders and good administrators that I that I've run across have wonderful teaching staff, and I'd like to say thank you to all the teachers because that's what it's about. It's the teachers, the students, the parents, and the administrators. A good administrator, like I said before, is only as good as his teaching staff. And it's important that we take care of our teachers and our teaching staff. Uh, you know, times are hard, but we, we can look to a brighter future. Uh, and I just want to thank the teachers for putting in all the hard work and time and dedication to making it, you know, a, I would say a successful year, semi-successful, based upon what they've had to overcome. Uh, kudos to, to, to all of our teachers. Uh, keep on striving, keep your heads up, you know, and we'll get through this. But teachers, thank you again. Administrators, thank you. Maintenance, physical plant, anybody that works in the district, thank you. Especially the, and the, cooking, the, the cooking crew. You know, I, had, I called over there and I spoke to the, the director, and she, she's doing a good job. But uh, I want to thank everybody in the Roswell Independent School District for, for bearing with us, and we'll get through this. And on the other side, we'll come out better. Thank you for that, Mr. Edwards. And with that, we will go ahead and end this meeting. May I have a motion to adjourn? Hello. I second, Ms. Sanchez. Second. Okay, who was that? Was that you, Mr. Edwards, that motioned? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And then uh, I think second was yeah. Ms. Sanchez. There we go. So roll call, please. Alan Getty. Yes. Hope Morales. Yes. Hilda Sanchez. Yes. Mona Kirk. Yes. James Edwards. Simone. All right.